If there's one single thing that any transit planner, advocate, writer, or YouTube content creator will tell you will make a transit system better, it's more service frequency. More frequent transit is faster, more convenient, more flexible, and thus more attractive to the traveling public. But like so many issues we face in public transit, often our desires run up against the realities of transit planning, system engineering, and vehicle design. So then, given that we all should agree that transit should be frequent, how can we design it to be? I've wanted to make this video for a long time, because so often our discussions about what transit and things like it should be miss the discussion of how we actually get there. I'm guilty of this too. Frequency is absolutely worth striving for, and I'm personally of the belief that there isn't really a lower cutoff that once you achieve, you can stop focusing on providing more service. Public transit shouldn't really operate with the mentality that once the buses or trains operate every 15 minutes, the job is done. In a world where, at least on metro systems, you can often run two shorter trains instead of one larger one, we can basically always benefit from higher frequencies. I actually wrote an entire Substack article about this, so if you're interested in that, check it out down below. At the center of high frequency service are short dwell times. Dwell time is the amount of time that a train, tram, or bus dwells at a station or a stop. And to be able to operate high frequency service, each vehicle needs to be able to stop, unload, load new passengers, and get moving again as quickly as possible. So much of maintaining low dwell times on transit is about the vehicles themselves, which is part of why I focus on vehicles so much on my channel. The vehicles have real impacts and can impose real restrictions on the service that can be operated. You can have a vehicle which is designed to be conducive to high frequency service, and then you can have one that isn't. The most obvious way this manifests for frequency is the number of doors on a vehicle. Almost any vehicle with more doors is going to be able to board and light passengers faster than one with less. Compare, for example, a typical bus in North America with a typical one in Europe. North American buses often operate less frequent service and have less doors. And where this gets really problematic is the fact that there isn't even a North American bus company that currently makes buses with the number of doors that you'll see commonly in Europe, meaning that frequencies are kind of artificially restricted here. You can make similar comparisons with suburban rail. Look at a train in North America compared to one that, say, operates on an S-Bahn service in Germany. You'll typically see more doors on the German service, because naturally, to operate more frequency, you should have more doors. And in all honesty, you can even see this distinction with metro services. But it's important to remember that the raw, absolute value number of doors isn't the only thing that impacts boarding and unloading time. What's really important is the actual combined size of the door face. Three big doors, like on Montreal's new metro rolling stock, might actually be better than four small ones, like on their older rolling stock. One of my friends was actually recently in Macau and shared with me that their LRT has enormously large doors, and it just goes to show how variable something as simple as a door can actually be. There's actually an entire science that deals with the scaling of doors, talking about things like passenger flows. And the reality is there are actually optimal door sizes that allow people to simultaneously get on and off without wasting extra space that won't fit an additional person. It's these things about public transit, like the sizing of the doors and how that can be an actual science, that I think people don't often appreciate. And the doors aren't the only passenger flow consideration. The interior layout of a train or bus is also super important. Seats and stanchions are important, but if you have too many of them near the door, that can restrict the flow of people into and out of the vehicle, and thus slow down your dwell times. They can also mean that passengers sort of have to struggle to get off the vehicle in the first place, which can mean a door getting held, which delays the service, or people just having to wait longer to get onto the vehicle, which also delays the service. What's really interesting is that a lot of new vehicles, like say those on the London Overground, have subtle design features that are meant to help encourage passengers to move into the train, thus improving capacity utilization and minimizing congestion. For example, having more handholds the further away from the doors you get. The actual train's performance is also really important. A slow train can't clear a platform as quickly, which is why all of the highest frequency systems in the world use single-decker rolling stock that does not use locomotives but has distributed traction. It's also part of why rubber-tired transit systems often have a history of being very frequent. Tires aren't necessary, but the extra traction does help. Now, to work with the vehicles, you need the right infrastructure that can convey those vehicles at a high frequency. 
For trains or trams, or I guess trolleys, you need to make sure you have sufficient power supply to operate tons of vehicles concurrently. You'd actually be surprised how many transit services out there don't operate more service simply because they don't have sufficient traction power. Of course, for trains, you also need high capacity signaling. Often this is moving block, but you don't actually need moving block signaling for high frequency. It just allows for more reliability and sophistication, which is important to be clear. Track layout and at a macro level, network topology is also important to sustaining high frequency service. A system like the Paris RER has a very clear branched approach where generally, RERC excluded from this, a single core city center trunk is fed by a number of branches on either side of the city. This is in contrast to, for example, the New York City subway, where each outlying branch might serve multiple city center trunks, leading to a lot more complex operations that are fickle and often lead to longer headways. On a more micro level, the design of certain stations and in particular terminals can have a big impact on frequency. Loops can actually be a pretty good solution for operating a high frequency transit service, allowing the driver of a manned train to just turn around without having to go to the other end of the station. Loops can actually be a pretty good option, but they're expensive and take up a ton of space. So these days, the preferred high frequency rail terminal tends to have two platforms, side platforms typically, one dedicated to unloading and one dedicated to loading with reversing sidings beyond the station. The operation of such a terminal works like this. A train comes in, unloads its passengers, goes into the reversing sidings, turns around, comes back into the loading platform, loads its passengers, and then heads out onto the line. If you don't believe me, this is kind of the optimal design. Open up open track, try simulating it, you'll see. Separating the loading, unloading, and reversing phases does wonders. Speed is also super important. Restrictive speeds into and out of a station make operating high frequencies harder because each train necessarily has to spend more time in the station. Sometimes to mitigate this, older systems have added additional platforms at terminal stations to try to turn more trains when they can't necessarily all rocket into and out of the station. And none of this is limited to trains. Busways, as I've discussed in previous videos, can have enormous capacity. But that capacity depends on good infrastructure design. Most importantly, multiple bus bays at stations, so lots of buses can board and light passengers at once, and bypass lanes, so that buses can bypass stations they're not stopping at without being stopped, thus increasing the throughput of the line. In general, any transit system that wants to operate high frequencies needs to have a lot of reliability and, in some cases, systems redundancy. And that's just because, in general, when vehicles might be operating 80 or 90 seconds apart, the margin for error is tiny. The last big element that I think needs to be designed for high frequency operation is the stops or the stations. If these elements are not designed properly or are undersized, then it's going to create congestion, which slows the speed at which people can board and alight from vehicles and thus impacts dwell times. Stations which are going to have both high frequency service and high passenger flows need to be meticulously designed. This desire for better flows at high frequency service stations has led to a number of interesting designs. For example, tons of stations in Spain use the Spanish solution, as well as the Stamstraka in Munich where you have platforms on both sides of the track, allowing trains to use all of their doors at once instead of just half of them to load and unload passengers. On a through running mainline station, you also need to design for high frequency, but you need to adapt that design to the vehicles you're handling. Often intercity trains have less doors and thus need to dwell for longer. And so in the case of say Berlin main station or the new through running Stuttgart 21 station, each approach track actually splits into two tracks in the station that surround a single island platform. That way, a train can come from the approach track and enter one side of the platform, and as it's unloading, another train can come in and use the other side of the platform, compensating for the longer dwell times that are sometimes just necessary with trains that have less doors and more seats. This design can also allow for some much needed resiliency, since intercity trains do sometimes get delayed, as well as the ability to have one train entering a station at the exact same time another is departing. I hope with this video you can sort of see that while almost every transit system out there could stand to have higher frequencies, these aren't something that happened by accident. Transit systems need to be conceived or sometimes reconceived to provide fast, reliable service while also providing a high volume of service. Thanks for watching.